Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I am excited to welcome everybody to the 18th annual Summer Student Research Symposium. And it's for the first time this year coming to you in virtual format. The symposium today is going to showcase the work of students in the Emerging Caribbean Scientists or ECS program, which offers scholarships, summer programs, research experiences, mentoring, and supplemental instruction to UVI students majoring in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, also known as STEM. Programs within the ECS program include maximizing access to career centers, historically black colleges and universities undergraduate program, research initiative for scientific engagement, summer undergraduate research experience, and summer sophomore research institute. The University of the Virgin Islands is also one of 10 minority serving universities for cooperative agreement awards with NASA under the Min Minority University Research and Education Project. The Cybersecurity Fellowship Program at UVI has a goal to provide training and in the future, increase the number and diversity of the nation's cybersecurity experts. In addition to these programs, this year's summer research is supported by the National Science Foundation, the College of Science and Math, and generous donations from private donors. At this symposium, we have six sessions that are going to be run concurrently. As of right now, and I hope you guys um, know this because you clicked on this link, we are sitting in the marine biology session. Um, you can find the schedule in the abstract book at the UVI ECS website. So we will keep the presentations on schedule as best we can to allow symposium attendees um, the opportunity to move between the sessions. So you can leave and enter any session as often as you like. And note that we will really try to stick to schedule. So if a student is missing, um, the next presentation is gonna start um, at the scheduled time. So we'll take a pause. So each of our presentations today are going to be hopefully around seven minutes in time. And then we'll have about two to three question, two to three minutes for questions from the audience. So we ask that if you have questions for the presenters that you please share those in the comments and then I will facilitate the questions to the presenters if they are present. For some of our presenters today, we have pre-recorded videos, but for those who are presenting live, I will um, try to give you a five minute warning um, once you've reached five minutes in your presentation so that you know you have about two minutes to wrap up. All right, and with that, let's see where we're at in time. We have about two minutes before our first presenter, Emily Henriquez, is going to kick us off today. Um, excuse me, so I, if you're live, are you putting up your own PowerPoint? Or are you guys putting it up and? Sure, so I'm prepared to put the PowerPoint up on my end, but if it's easier for you to put the PowerPoint up, I can give you the ability to share your screen and that way you should be able to advance your slides as you want. Otherwise, I can do it and you can just tell me next when you want me to advance the slide. Oh, oh, then I'll just do it from my computer then. Okay, sure. I believe, here we go. I think you should have permission to do that now. Um, if you want to give it a try, you're set to start in just one minute. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, just tell me when to start. Okay. All right, Emily, I think you can kick us off. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Henriquez-Pillier. I worked in Dr. Alice Stanford's lab this summer, and my research was on 
the genetics of the invasive seagrass Halophila stipulacea. Seagrass are very important for our ecosystems and economy. They can, they are nurseries for young fish. They can convert CO2. They're food for different organisms, can help on runoff from the land. And many things can threaten our seagrass, whether it be from on land or in the sea. One such thing is the introduction of an invasive species. Today, we'll be talking about the invasive seagrass, Holophila stipulacea. It originated in the Indian Ocean, and when the Suez Canal opened in 1869, it was able to move to the Mediterranean, where it was then able to migrate across the Atlantic Ocean into the Caribbean, where it was found in Grenada in 2002 and propagated throughout the Caribbean and was found on St. John in 2012. This is a picture of the invasive seagrass. And this seagrass is known to be a fighter. It's able to withstand different light intensities, different water temperatures, different salinities, even unfavorable conditions. This seagrass can thrive. And the reason why this is important is because different organisms are sea organisms don't seem to favor this invasive seagrass. They favor their native seagrass. So this is a problem because then the native seagrass will decline while the invasive seagrass increases. And unless these native populations start favoring it, we will have a problem in the future. And different researchers are looking at different things, whether it be sediment or water movement. But my lab focused on the genetic importance of it. And we tested for genetic structure and clonal variation and wanted to know what can genotypes tell us about the invasion of Holophila stipulacea. And we believe that in the once the seagrass invades, expansion is not related to genotype. And then my second question were, was, were there any differences in extraction quality throughout the various years since this project was started in 2016? And I believe there won't be any differences in extraction quality. And since this project was started in 2016, my main objective was to confirm such replicate the data from the previous years. So first we collected the samples from eight different sites on from three different islands, St. Thomas, St. John and Water Island. And we did the DNA extraction process and we did PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, which is just an easy way to copy the DNA and make billions of copies of it. And then we sent it off for DNA sequencing. And my progress so far is that I did 60, around 60 different samples this summer. And I did extraction, I did ligation and so forth. And then once that the DNA samples that we sent off for sequencing come back, we put them into GenClone, which is a computer program to analyze genotypic data. And we, I don't have this yet, but this is the intended results of what it would look like. So here you can see the eight different sites that we collected from. And over here on the left, you can see the genetic data. So we labeled the different genes we found uh, from 1 through 16 because we found 16 different genotypes. And you can see that genotype number one was the most abundant and we labeled it number one. And this graph can also tell you how far apart these genes were from each other, such as here in Brewers Bay. This first gene number one was very far from the number two genotype that we found. But in Bolongo Bay here, you can see that 10 the gene number 10 and 11 that we found were very close to each other. So that could be an indicator of something and we could look more into it in the future. What this bar is telling us is maybe that this happened through multiple invasion because that's what we want to know. Is this seagrass still being invading, is still invading our island? And due to multiple genotypes, it could be a suggestion of that. It could also be a suggest suggestion of a mutation. It's mutating very rapidly. So for my second question was about DNA extraction quantity. And so I tested it from summer 2020, which is my year, 2016, which was the year the, the research started and 2017, which was the year the research was pretty much settled, like 
the process of it. And there was a significant difference between 2017 and the other years. As you can see, 2017 has a large extraction quantity. And this could be because 2017 had the processes were already established, unlike 2016, where the research was new, different protocols were being created, people had to get used to the different um, processes. And then in summer 2020, I was using old leaves, so dried leaves that were already stored. But as you can see, summer 2020 and 2016 didn't really have much of a difference. So I would say it was definitely a success, even though it's less than 2017. This DNA that was found in summer 2020 could still be used for good DNA results for when the sequences come back. So I would like to acknowledge um, NIH Mark, which is I'm a program at, and everyone in the ECS program. Thank you. Are there any Thank you so much, Emily. So I don't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has questions for Emily, please feel free to share them. We have about four minutes for questions. And um, while anybody is working on typing those up, Emily, I have a question for you. So you said that um, the difference in genetics that you saw is maybe indicating that there is a multiple or continued invasion of Halophila, is that right? Yes. So do you have an idea of how quickly Halophila itself is adapting um, in terms of like, like how fast a, a population would, would differentiate into two different genotypes? Um, I don't have um, any um, knowledge of that at this moment, no. Okay. I was wondering if maybe like um, Halophila beds from one bay, if they were like uh, differentiated from beds from another, if like blades from one bay were making their way over to others, that could be like that new invasion. Is that what you're kind of referring to? Yes, this could be an indication that these might be just um, fragments from one bay moving over to another bay, but, um, but there's no, um, indication of that at the moment. Okay. All right. Thank you. I see that Alice has added to the chat here that, um, you guys found all 16 of those genotypes of the species when it had only been established in the Virgin Islands for four years. So mm -hmm. she's saying that potentially all that mutation happened within that time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions for you, Emily, in the chat. So I think um, we'll move on to kind of queue up the next presentation so we're ready. Um, so thank you very much and great job. Okay, thank you. Um, I stop sharing, stop share, stop share. Uh, yeah. Okay, so our next speaker who I see popped on to the video is going to be Samuel Gittens Jr. And he has a, a pre-recorded presentation for you guys. So I'm gonna get that pulled up on my end and ready to go. Okay, and we're just going to wait one more minute just so we can keep with our time frame in case anybody is skipping in between sessions. And as a reminder, we are now in the marine biology session of the annual summer student research symposium. So thank you for joining us today. And um, as you watch our next presentation, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make, please put those in the chat and we'll share those with our speaker at the end. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samuel Gittins Jr. 
My mentor's name is Dr. Robin Smith, and the title of my project is called Assessing Herbivory of Three Common Reef Grazers and Potential Effects on Newly Settled Coral Roots. Grazers are animals that depend on feeding on plants as their primary food source. Grazing is an important process on coral reefs because it is known to be beneficial for coral resilience and it can tip the scales of coral algae interactions in the favor of corals and enhancing coral recruitment. My goal is to evaluate which species of grazers are optimal for use in land-based nurseries containing both adult and newly settled coral recruits. The three different species of common reef grazers selected for the project were Clibinarius tricolor, Pacarus catenati, and Turbinidae species. The coral species utilized in one of the experiments for my project was called Diploria lepidiformis, the groove brain coral. I conducted three experiments for this project, and they are rates of herbivory, grazing intensity, and feeding preferences. The rates of herbivory was to witness the percentage of consumption from at one moment in time from the three different species. Grazing intensity was to focus on to see if any of three species would knock any of the coral polyps while grazing. And lastly, the feeding preference was to see if the three species have a more preferred preference from three different types of algae. Only grazing intensity will have coral recruits evolve. Materials that I've used for this project were enclosures, MSJ, stereo microscope, nets, and buoyancy weight scale. For rates of herbivory, I created three equally sized enclosures for each herbiv herbivore species. They were placed on the top field of algae, and I used five of each species and placed them in an enclosure in which they were left to graze for a 16-hour incubation. Herbivory was estimated by analyzing before and after photos of the incubation. Images were imported into ImageJ software to calculate the areas grazed in the final images. For the sum of each species area consumption, Pacarus catenati was 1,339.11 mm, Turbinity was 951.28 mm, and Clibinarius tricolor was 46.58 mm. After doing the sum of each, I divided the sums by the number of organisms that was in the enclosures and divided again with the number of hours that the trial was. So my results were that 16.74 mm an hour of algae consumed per P. catenati, 11.89 mm per hour per each turbinity, and 0 0.58 mm per hour per each C. tricolor. Results indicate that P. catenati had the highest rates of herbivory, followed closely by the turbinity snails, and C. color C tricolor showed much lower rates of herbivory than any of the two. Grazing intensity was conducted by placing a substrate with 25 newly one month old cellocora polyps to a chamber containing five of each herbivore species. I used the chambers instead of the enclosures because I wanted the area for them to roam around to be constricted and have a better chance for them to interact with the substrate. I placed turbidity first with the substrate, then C tricolor, then P. catenati last. The grazers were interrupted with the polyps for two hours, after which a substrate were analyzed, was analyzed using a stereo microscope to, to assess presence or absence of the coral polyps. After viewing the influences from turbidity and sea tricolor incubations, all the coral polyps were accounted for, but when I viewed the substrate after the Pythagoras catenati incubation, I noticed one was missing. Feeding preferences were evaluated by collecting three different algae species from the beach by TNC, and they were Stargasm, Carlerpa cerdolores, and the Jania species. And I estimated their initial weights using buoyant weighting. Algal, algae species were then placed into nets with each herbivore species individually for a 24 hour incubation. After feeding incubations, Final weights were calculated, calculated to evaluate feeding preferences between grazers and algae species. I decided to do two trials for this ex experiment because when I was going through the final weights for the first trial, I realized in the chamber with Clibinarius tricolor that the sargasm was completely gone. I was not sure if it was because they had eaten all the sargasm or that the sargasm went through the holes of the net and rested in the bottom of the tank, but I decided that I would switch the net for the Clibinarius tricolor with a net that has smaller holes and do a second trial. After feeding incubations, final weights were calculated to evaluate feeding preferences between grazers and algal species. 
The blue lines in the graphs are the initial weights, and the orange lines were the final weights after 24 hours. Results indicate that both C. tricolor and P. cardinati preferred sargasm, whereas turbinity preferred tolerpa. Jania was the least preferred allergy for all three herbivore species. A possible explanation for Jania would be that it is too brittle for the herbivores to eat, while Tolerpa and Sargasm have a softer texture which can be more easily grazed. A reason that may explain why Seek Tricolor did not eat as much as the other two species for rays of herbivory can be because the species were mostly focused on escaping the enclosure than eating. For the missing polyp during the peak Cadenati incubation, I cannot assume if it was due to grazing or natural causes because I did not set up sufficient controls with the experiment. When I was going to record the peak Cadenati knocked off the core polyp after the incubation, my mentor mentioned that polyps can do this action called polyp bailout. So polyp bailout is a colostress stress response that involves the detachment of individual polyps from the colonial form as a means of escaping unfavorable conditions. For my conclusion, I can say that sea tricolor will not be efficient for grazing coral recruit nurseries. I can't conclude on grazing intensity due to not fully knowing what caused the coral to disband from its skeleton. Lastly, algae with soft texture can be easily grazed if present in a coral nursery. Brittle-like algae will most likely be untouched by grazers. These are the sources that I have used throughout the project. And this research was funded through the National Science Foundation and Clues Program, award number 1930991. Special thanks to Seas Alliance, Space, Seas Islands Alliance, and the Nature Conservancy. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Samuel. So if anybody has any questions for Samuel, please um, put those up in the chat. And we have about three minutes to take those questions. Samuel, I have a question for you. So you were looking okay. at the, um, I guess, like um, how good each of these species were to kind of help maintain um, coral recruit nurseries. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So besides um, just like looking at their behavior in terms of like eating the algae in the nurseries, are there other things that you need to do to maintain their populations that would maybe make one species better than the other? As in the grazing species? Yeah. Uh, well, for one, the temperature needs to be in a favorable condition for them because earlier in the week, there was a temperature spike for one of the weekends and most of my herbivores died. So you will need to have a good enough temperature for them to be able to live because I had a good reasonable number to use, mostly like five at a time and then later on three because most of them died eventually on. So I think temperature should be the most thing to focus on okay and also pops possibly the allergy as well so they could actually eat it besides not you know facing against each other and trying to get what's there first so at least like a, abundance of allergy should be good for them to eat as well okay great thanks i see another uh, question here coming in the comments um for the most efficient grazer do you think grazer size or stage juvenile or adult makes a difference um I might say yes, because the P. Cadenati was the biggest, was the biggest, was bigger than the C. tricolor, and they had the most um, consumption of besides the C. tricolor. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not really sure because the C. tricolor wasn't really eating, it was just trying to get out of the enclosure. So I can't say if sizes of matter for that. Okay, great, thank you. So Samuel, you have one more question um, in the group chat, but I'm going to have to get our next presentation queued up here. So maybe you can go into the chat and answer that question there. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Thank Great. you. So our next speaker is going to be Vernell Callwood.
my name is Vernal Cobbled and today I'll be presenting my ECS summer project which was dial variation and number of fish visits to anemone cleaning stations and my advisor was Dr. Stephen Ratchford. Before we begin, I would like to explain a little bit about dial. Dial is basically the 24-hour period, so throughout the day, and we are looking at the fish visit variation to the anemone cleaning stations and viewing how much fish visited throughout the day and if they were cleaned or not. So the three main components of our research was the corkscrew anemone, Bartholomew and Eulata, the spotted cleaner shrimp, Periclemes yucatanus, and the Peterson cleaner shrimp, Isalomys petersoni, and these two cleaner shrimp live on the corkscrew anemone and clean fish as they pass by throughout the day. We read other scientific literature that did research on this similar topic and we found two competing hypotheses as to why fish stop to get clean. The first one being parasite removal. So some parasites like gnathids parasitize the fish overnight and this causes a heavy load of parasite parasites in the early morning. And the second hypothesis is tactile stimulation. So some fish might stop to get clean to relieve stress throughout the day. So while reading some of these papers, we noticed that there weren't any, there wasn't much evidence that cleaners clean at night. So they should be more willing to clean in the morning. So this is why there's a heavier parasite load in the morning. So cleaners might clean more in the morning because they can see and because they're hungry. And with some research, they claim to find no difference, but failed to find a difference in temporal cleaning rates, while other research did not find many differences in client fish behaviors towards cleaner fish over the day. The question we looked at was, is there a difference in number of fish visits by time of day? To conduct this research, we placed GoPro cameras on four anemones and filmed from 5.30 a.m. to 7.15 p.m. on June 28th. With those videos, we watched them and then recorded the visit time and recorded the species that visited. So what we found was that there was a high amount of visits in the early morning as well as in the late afternoon and that was for three out of four of the anemones but on the fourth anemone there was not much of a peak and we noticed that there were different sets of clients on the fourth anemone so that resulted resulted in low peaks in the morning as well as in the afternoon so we noticed that both the early morning peak and the late afternoon peak were due to acanthirids, which we found was our dominating species. And acanthirids are made up of blue tanks, ocean surgeon fish, and doctor fish. We also noticed in some videos that there were several acanthirids at an enemy at the same time, and they interfered with each other's cleaning. So based on our results, we noticed that fish visitation has been dominated by the acanthirids. We also compared our results to another research, researcher's results. And in their research, we noticed that they did not find any differences between fish visitors. And this is because they didn't have many acanthirids in their study. And they also had a different study site than us. So we noticed that the change of a study site can affect the what species come at what time, and that dial variation may be species specific, thus vary by study site if fish species vary. So to further this study, we could look closer at acanthers to see why they have more parasites than other fish visits and if they do. This is the first study to show a temporal difference in fish behavior at anemone cleaning stations, and this is most likely due to the differences in the methods employed by our study. This study was the first study to follow the fish at the same anemone all day, whereas Titus watched each anemone for just a few hours at a different time of the day and ran statistical tests to generalize about all of the anemones at a couple times. They reported that there was no temporal variation when there they didn't really find one, which is different from ours. Their methods would have also failed to see the trends we saw, and they saw that some anemones have great peaks of fish visits and others do not, depending on the species of fish client visiting. 
Titus also reported rates of cleaning, not rates of fish visits, and reported that almost all fish were getting clean, whereas in our study we found only 30 to 40 percent of fish visits resulted in cleaning. Titus also found only few very acanthered fish at their site, which is a fish group that provided the greatest peaks in our study. Thus, the timing of fish visits and cleaning rates may not vary just by fish species, but also between sites, given that the sites may have a different number of very various potential client species, and even within a site between anemones, given that some anemones have different sets of client visitors. Cleaning may include parasite removal merely or just tactile stimulation, but both behaviors are thought to improve fish health and fish health could have a cascading effect on the surrounding ecosystem. The acanthers are algae gazers, grazers, so they eat the algae, they eat most of the algae in the water, and they may keep algae growth down such that corals are not overrun by algae. Corals provide many ecological benefits, such as being a home to many fish, and certainly healthy corals Reefs provide an economic benefit since many tourists come to the Caribbean to dive on the beautiful reefs full of fish. Here are my references. Before concluding, I would like to extend a special thank you to the Emerging Caribbean Scientists Undergraduate Research Program, the University of the Virgin Islands, and my ECS mentor, Dr. Stephen Ratchford. I would also like to acknowledge the funding the NSF HBCU UP ACE Implementation Project, the UVI Growth Model. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, then let me know. All right, great. Thank you so much, Brunel. So I see that you are on here and we've got a question for you from the chat. So uh, great job, Brunel. If you repeated your study on a bunch of different days, do you think you would find the same or different results? And why or why not? Well, as far as temporal variation goes, I'm not sure that we would find much of a change. I think that if we changed our study site, then we would probably find more of different species and maybe a temporal change. But if we're in the same study site, I don't think that we would. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then I guess I don't see any other questions in the chat, but I have a question for you. So I was interested to hear you, you mentioned that um, only about 30% of the time, I think you said fish were stopping at the station for cleaning. Um, so I'm curious about what they were doing when they weren't there to be cleaned. So other times when they weren't cleaning, I noticed that some might just swim in the area, like to survey the area. Some were grazing and then others were kind of chasing fish away. So the ones that were cleaning actually stopped and posed, whereas the others kind of just hung out around the area. Okay, gotcha, thank you. And I see another question came into the chat here for you. So is uh, coming to these stations for tactile stimulation something specific to Acanthuridae or do other fish types come in for that as well? Other fish also come in for that. We just noticed that we had more acanthids than other species in our study. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Vernell. So I think with Thank that, we're you. going to um, pivot over to our next speaker today. Um, we're going to hear from Khalifa Powell. And as a reminder to anybody, if people are hopping in and out, we are right now in the marine biology section of the annual student summer research symposium. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, I ask that if you have any questions for the next speaker that you pop them into the chat so we can facilitate those afterwards. Good afternoon. My name is Khalifa Powell and my mentor is Dr. Steven Ratchford. My summer project is fish client species showing a wide variety of posing behaviors towards anemone cleaning shrimps. As you can see from my background, there's a blue tang posing next to an anemone trying to get cleaned. 
I looked at a symbiotic relationship between a corkscrew anemone, the shrimp, and the client fish. The corkscrew anemone, scientific name is the Bartholomea annulata, and the shrimps I looked at were the Ancylomenes petersonine, which is also known as the Peterson cleaner shrimp, and the Periclymenes yucatanicus, which is also known as the spotted cleaner shrimp. Communication between species with a symbiotic relationship is very important, but can be very difficult. The fish locates the shrimp to get rid of their parasites or for a tactile stimulation, which is also known as a massage. In a journal I read by Mary Wickstein about the behaviors of client fish, she said there was 41 species of 20 different families that came up to the anemone to get cleaned. Since there are so many different species of fish that come up to the anemone to get cleaned, they all have to communicate in a different way. Posing is a type of signal that gets the shrimp's attention. Which leads me to my objective. My objective is to quantify and compare behaviors that different species of fish exhibit to get cleaned by anemone shrimp. For my methods, Dr. Radford used underwater GoPro cameras to capture videos of fish visits at anemone stations from January to June of 2020. After I watched the videos, I recorded the different species of fish that came up to the anemone, the time that they visited, and whether or not the fish were cleaned. For my project, I randomly chose 10 videos of each species that came up to the anemone and I looked at their different behaviors towards the cleaner shrimps. I looked at whether they were up in the water column or, at the, or on the ocean floor. I looked at whether they were flapping their gills and fins rapidly or slowly. I looked at if they were opening their mouths slowly or rapidly. And then I looked at the if they had if they had a color change these are the five different species of fish i looked at for my project i chose these five fishes because they came up to the anemone the most out of all the other fishes as you can see the majority of the fishes are up in the water column which is the orange while there's only 20 percent of the fish that were at the bottom the top pic shows the ocean surgeon and the lane snapper up in the water column, which means they are hovering in the water currents next to the anemone, while the bottom pic shows the parafish leaning on its left side and touching the bottom of the ocean floor. The rakhine, the parafish, and the lizardfish are the ones who touch the bottom of the ocean floor, and they also come to the anemone the least. I saw that there are some fishes that move their fins rapidly while others move their fins more slowly. The butterfly fishes, tangs, ocean surgeons, and lane snappers have a lot of blue, which means they flap their pectoral fins rapidly, while the grunts flap their pectoral fins more slowly. The next graph shows that once again, the butterfly fishes, tangs, and ocean surgeons flap their dorsal fins rapidly, while the grunts and lane snappers flap their dorsal fins slowly. Same goes for the caudal fins, which is the tail. The butterfly fishes, tangs, and ocean surgeons were flapping their caudal fins rapidly, while the grunts and lane snappers flapped it more slowly. As you look at both of the graphs, you can see that the butterfly fishes, the tanks, and the ocean surgeons are the three species of fish that are flapping their gills and opening and closing their mouths rapidly, while the grunts and the lane snappers flap their gills and open and close their mouths very slowly. There were even some fishes that did not flap their gills or open their mouths at all. The fish that were not that active were more likely to have a color change which were the grunts and the lane snappers. The butterfly fish, the tang and ocean surgeons rarely or didn't darken at all and they didn't really have any vertical bars. As you can see from the top picture, the lane snapper doesn't have anything abnormal about his scales. But the bottom picture shows these stripes going from top to the bottom vertically. After analyzing all the data, I have concluded that the butterfly fishes, tangs, and ocean surgeons are very active. They were the fishes that had rapid movements while the grunts and lane snappers had slow movements. The grunts and lane snappers also had color changes while the more active fishes barely or didn't have a color change at all. 
A 2018 paper demonstrated that darker coloration in fish led to a greater chance in being cleaned. She argued that since cleaner shrimps have poor eyesight, the darker colorations of some fish may help silhouette the fish against bright backgrounds. Some of the fish in our study did darken. These fish might also change color to hide from predators, but we do not know for sure since that behavior has not been studied yet. Several of the fish in our study did not darken, but these fish might be communicating in another way. Not through visuals, but through pulses of water generated by flapping their fins and gills. The fish could have also released chemicals with the pulsing water. Shrimps are good at receiving chemical and physical cues. This possible form of communication needs further study. Fish behaviors are very important because if a shrimp sees that fish wants to get cleaned, it may or may not clean it. If the shrimp does clean the fish, the fish will now be less likely to get sick since the shrimp is now taking off the fish's parasites. Healthy fishes create a healthy ecosystem. If the fishes were sickly, bigger predators would eat the sick fish and fall ill themselves. Humans would like to eat healthy fish so they don't get sick because if humans ate sick fish, they could get food poisoning. I want to thank the University of the Virgin Islands, ECS, SURP for giving me this opportunity to do my research over the summer. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Radford, and my group member, Janae Bruce, for helping me with my research project and collecting data. I want to say a special thanks to the NSF, HBCU, UP, ACE Implementation Project, the UVI Growth Model, for funding the Emerging Caribbean Scientist Program. Here are my references. I also want to thank the audience for listening to my presentation. Do you have any questions? Okay, wonderful, great. Thank you so much, Khalifa. That was a fun presentation. Um, so I don't see any um, questions in the chat yet, but if anybody who is watching has questions for Khalifa, please type those there. And um, I'll, I'll start with one question that I thought of for you. Um, so you looked at these different behaviors um, across the fish, but did you take note of how often those behaviors resulted in cleaning? I did. Okay, so I'm wondering, did you find any um, like differences where fish that were moving faster are getting cleaned more often or vice versa? Well, some fishes that move faster weren't getting cleaned like the butterfly fish because they are very greedy. So when they come, they get cleaned and then they will leave and they will come back and they will stay there hugging the cleaning station and then they would leave and then they will come back and they wouldn't get cleaned during those times. Oh, okay. Huh. So do you think that they, um, did you observe them actively like um, chasing off or like interacting with other fish who are coming to the station? Yes. Gotcha, very cool. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions for Khalifa in the chat. Um, if anybody thinks of anything else they would like to ask her, I'm sure you can type that in there and she could respond uh, within the group chat itself. Uh, so thank you very much, Khalifa, for your presentation. You're welcome. All right, so our, um, our next speaker today is going to be uh, Janae Bruce. And as a reminder, we are in the marine biology session of the annual Summer Student Research Symposium. So thank you everybody for joining us. Okay, and we'll just wait one minute so that we can keep the schedule. We'll start right at 1.50. My name is Janae Bruce. My mentor is Dr. Stephen Ratchford, and my presentation is about cleaner shrimp having preferred clients for cleaning. 
For my research, we looked at two different types of cleaner shrimp. The Ansylomenes petersoni, or Peterson cleaning shrimp, pictured on the top right, and the Paraclimenes yucatanicus, also known as the spotted cleaner shrimp, pictured on the bottom right. These shrimps have a symbiotic relationship with the corkscrew anemone, pictured here, which is their home and is also where client fish come up to get cleaned. The relationship between the fish and the shrimp is more of a mutualistic relationship, meaning that they both benefit from the interaction. The fish benefits by having the parasites on its body removed, and the shrimp benefits by getting a meal from eating those parasites. In addition, there are several fish clients that come up to an anemone to get clean, but a few of the common ones are blue tangs, ocean surgeons, doctor fish, grunts, Bill Gregory, parrotfish, and lane snappers. As part of our research, we reviewed different scientific literature, and most of them focus on cleaner fish such as gobies and cleaner rats. Both cleaner shrimp and fish serve a wide variety of clients, often showing that there is an overlap in the type of clients that they serve. There was some literature dealing with cleaner shrimp, but the ones that addressed them did not discuss how often the fish visited and seemed to suggest that all client fish get clean with no preference. However, preliminary observations have shown this not to be the case. And this gap in knowledge led us to our research question, which is, do cleaner shrimp have preferred clients? To figure this out, we looked at how often each client visited versus whether they got cleaned or not. For our methods, we were given a set of videos recorded by GoPro cameras from January to June 2020. The videos taken in these six months were recorded on a weekly basis and they replaced that different anemone which contained the shrimp that we looked at. Overall, we ended up watching over 240 hours of footage from the cameras and recorded data from that footage such as what type of fish were visiting, whether said fish got cleaned or not, and the amount of time each visit lasted. Then afterwards, we summarized that data to look back at which species visited most often and which species was cleaned the greatest percentage of the time. If there is a preference, then it's most likely to be the fish that get cleaned the greater percentage of the time that they visit. So which fish visited most often? The graph on the left shows the number of visits by different species of fish, which is indicated by the vertical bars on the y-axis. The amount clean is shown in gold and the amount not clean is shown in pale yellow. From the graph, you can see that there is a great variation in how often these fish visited, and this proves that not all fish that visit get clean, contrary to what some papers were saying as mentioned earlier. On the graph to the right, we looked at what percentage of the time did the ones that visit get cleaned, with percentage cleaned in gold and percent not cleaned in pale yellow. One might think that the fish that showed up more often would get cleaned more, but on the contrary, it was the fish that showed up less often that had a higher percentage of cleanings. For instance, on the right graph, you can see that damselfish, rock hinds, and angels had the highest percentage of cleans, but on the left graph, they're the fish that didn't visit very often. Conversely, the fish that showed up a lot in the left graph, such as butterfly fish, parrots, and grunts, they didn't have a high percentage of cleans on the right graph. This observation led us to believe that the rarer the fish is, or the less a species of fish visits an anemone, the more likely they are to get cleaned. As mentioned before, there is great variation in the number of visits across the various species, with not all of them getting cleaned. And generally, those that visited the most often were cleaned the least percentage of the time. Some of the ideas that came to mind as to why this may be the case was that the fish that aren't preferred clients may visit so often because they're coming back repeatedly in an effort to get clean. This might be due to them having a higher parasite load or a different set of parasites that are quite irritating, so they want to get those removed, which is why they're constantly coming back. Another reason they might not be preferred is because that fish wants to receive tactile stimulation instead. 
And if that's true, then there's not much in it for the shrimp. So the shrimp might not be interested in going onto those fish. And in the end, the reason why the shrimp may hop onto those non-preferred clients is to placate them and to get them to leave. Additionally, the reason why rarer fish might be preferred clients is because they have a different type of parasite on their body, which would provide variation to the shrimp's diet. All of these, however, would need further study to be confirmed. So it could be that parasites can affect the health of a fish. So getting clean of its parasites may be necessary for a fish's health and healthy fish contribute to maintaining the oceanic ecosystem. For instance, some of the fish getting cleaned by these cleaner shrimp eat algae and help maintain algae levels in the ocean, which is important because as we know, too much algae can have adverse effects. And these are my references. Great appreciation is extended towards the Summer Undergraduate Research Program, the National Science Foundation, the College of Science and Mathematics, Dr. Stephen Ratchford and Khalifa Powell, whom I work closely with when reviewing the camera footage we received. Research funding was provided by the National Science Foundation HBCU of ACE Implementation Project. And I also wish to thank the audience for taking the time to listen to my presentation. On the bottom is my contact email for anyone who wishes to reach out to me. And any questions? Great, thank you so much, Janae. If anybody has any questions for Janae, please put those into the chat and I will pass those along to her. And I guess to kick us off, I have a question for you, Janae, if you are on here, I see you. Um, so I'm wondering, is there any risk to the cleaner shrimp? And does that risk differ um, across different sp fish species? So do they ever get like snipped at or like, do the fish ever try to eat them? And do some species exhibit that behavior maybe more than others? Well, there is risk to the shrimp when they clean a client, but most of the fish that we've observed do not um, do not really snip, snip at the, um, the fish or try to eat them. So I wouldn't say there's any of that going on, but there was one video that I did observe a fish get eaten by a shrimp. So that was kind of shocking to me when I saw it. That's pretty crazy. Can you say a little more about that? I'm curious, like what, what kind of fish was it? So it wasn't a fish that was coming up to get clean, but rather just the larger fish that was passing by and it, um, it came close to the anemone where the shrimp was on and it just ate it and swam off with it in its mouth. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions for you right now, Janae. If anybody thinks of any, I'm sure you can put them into the chat. So thank you very much. I think we'll move on now to our um, next speakers. So um, just as a reminder to people who are coming in and out, we are in the marine biology section of the 18th annual Summer Student Re Research Symposium. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, our next speakers are going to be Alanika and Carissa. And I um, will pull up their presentation now. And I see, um, uh, Chris, you're on here. You guys have a, a PowerPoint, so you're going to be doing your presentation live. Is that right? Would you prefer yes. to broadcast the PowerPoint from your computer or do you want me to do it? Um, that's fine, I could do it. Okay, sure. Okay, I believe I just gave you permissions. Great, I can see your screen. Um, and we'll just uh, wait until we hit 2 p.m. and we can start right on the button. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carissa Moses, and I am presenting alongside with my partner, Lanika Kalanair. Um, We also have another research partner who is 
Xavier um, Xavier Richardson. He will be presenting right after us with his assignment. Our mentors are Dr. Robert Souls and Dr. Marilyn Brandt. And we will be presenting on the topic of quantifying the spread of the Sony tissue coral loss disease, Sony coral tissue loss disease in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So, cellal D is a disease that kills the affected corals within weeks or months by destroying its tissues, leaving behind white lesions. It originated in the Florida Keys and was discovered in St. Thomas in December 2018. It has recently spread to the island of St. John and hasn't been sighted on St. Croix as of yet. This, is, this disease affects coral reefs, which provide us with shoreline protection, beach recreation, better water quality, medicine uses, fish supply, and contribute to our tourism industry, as well as provide a habitat for our marine life. Thus, our research question is, how can the spread of cell D be quantified? So, the methodology we use to the estimate the diffusion city was to first start with the data from when the disease first emerged in the in the VI. Then each month we measured how far the distance spread by looking at the initial month when the affected site first emerged, which is represented by the level N, to the following month, which is represented by N plus one. Then we made a distance matrix between all of the previous infected sites to the newly emerged infected sites in the N plus one site. And then for each newly infected site in the N plus one site, we determine the distance to the closest existing ex infected site and then made a ma distance matrix. Next, we measure the average minimal distance between the closest infected reef site and newly infested reef sites and created a model of the relationship between the distance the disease travel from the initial outbreak and time. Here we have our results. This first figure depicts the distance that Scuttledy traveled from the initial infected reefs to the newly infected reefs each month. We calculated the distance by using the equation below. This figure depicts the confidence interval for the average minimal distance between the closest infected reefs and newly infected reefs. We are 95% confident that the rate of the disease falls between the two red lines on the graph. Additionally, on average, Scuttle D traveled approximately 2,937 meters per month. Here, we have a figure that depicts St. Thomas. And it depicts the expansion of Scuttle D from December 2018 to January 2019. The red circles represent the initial infected reefs from December 2018, and the blue circles are the newly infected reefs from the following months up until January 2019. The black lines represent the distance the disease traveled between the sites. Based on our results, we concluded that the expansion of Scholar D increases as time progresses. We determined a 95% confidence interval for the average distance the disease traveled per month. By studying the expansion of the disease, we can gain a better understanding of it to find efficient and long lasting treatments to combat it. And finally, plans for the restoration of the affected coral reefs can be devised using connectivity graphs. So our future work would be to update our code to ensure that the distances modeling the spread of the disease does not cross over land. We have started this, but have not quite finished it. Yet, finished it. We will also like to develop a connectivity graph of the coral reefs and also use the ocean currents to model the upstream versus the downstream spread of the disease. These are our references and our acknowledgements. We would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Dr. Robert Souls, NH, NIH, Mark at EVI, a holistic approach, and NSF, HBCU, UP, 
AS implementation project, the UVI growth model. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you both. If anybody has any questions, um, please pop them in the chat and I will pass them along. And I don't see any questions from the chat yet, but um, I have a question for you guys. Um, well, first I'll say that I'm excited that you are gonna incorporate um, ocean currents into your model because I think that that'll, um, that could yield some interesting results. Mm -hmm. um, I have one question that's a, a clarification question. So you guys so mentioned that as time increases, the um the spread of the disease increases and yes. i'm curious does that mean that um it's it's spreading like more quickly or it's spreading to more sites does that make sense yes it does it um it means that it is spreading more quickly more quickly every month. okay yes. and it's also spreading to more, spreading sites, to more sites every month yeah. <laughs> great thanks So I don't see any more questions in the chat yet, but we have about four minutes before our next presentation. So if you guys are okay, then I have another question for you. Um, I'm curious if you looked at all about reef specific effects or if you had thought about incorporating that into your model. So for example, do you think that if a reef has more coral on it, that that would maybe increase or affect its likelihood of getting the disease? Um, I would like I would say Alanica was um we was discussing how um how that could be a possibility as well, as well as having like um does it spread more quickly to the, like the deep um coral reefs versus like the shallow coral reefs. We would like to know if, if we can make a model depicting those type of relationships as well. So yes. Hey, cool. Glad to hear that you guys are thinking about all these different avenues with your model. All right. Well, if anybody else who's watching has any more questions, um, I'm sure you guys can um, pop them in the chat. We have a couple of minutes before our next presentation from um, Xavier Richardson. And um, just to keep the timing right, in case anybody is jumping in and out of our sessions, we're going to wait until 2.10 to start that one. Okay, and uh, Xavier, I see that you're on here. Um, do you want to share your PowerPoint or would you like me to do it from my end? I would like to share my screen. Okay, all right, um, give me one second and I should, I can get that. Okay. Okay, you should have the permission now. Okay, I see um, we had one question come into the chat here for our last presenters. Um, so they would like to know, what are the major factors that can increase the spread or decrease the spread of the disease? Um, I would say it will be the ocean currents and I guess um, the wind, like the direction of the wind, how, in what direction the wind will, um, push the disease in would also have an effect. Alrighty, Xavier, you can take it away. Um, 
I'm going to be piggybacking on what my two research mates just said, but I had an extra piece. So um, quantifying the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease using a random walk model simulation. Um, this was done by me and my mentors as before were Dr. Robert Stowes and Dr. Marilyn Brad. Now I'm going to do a quick recap. What exactly is stony coral tissue loss disease? Stony t coral tissue loss disease or SCTLD is in a disease affecting over 20 species of hard corals. SCTLD poses a particular signif particularly significant threat because of its range, duration, and high rates of mortality. It is suspected to be consi is considered to be a, a bacterial pathogen, meaning if we can quantify this, spread of this, this disease, we may be able to treat it with antibiotics. It is believed that the disease spreads through diffusion, avection, and ocean currents. Diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration due to the random movements of particles. A passive, this is a passive process in which no energy is needed. The, the disease also moves through ocean currents because ocean currents move pretty much everything in the water. So. How do we actually quantify that spread? Because diffusion is the random movement of particles, we thought it'd be smart to use a random walk model to quantify the spread. A random walk, a random walk is a model that moves east, north, west, or south, or not moving at all based on the probabilities given. It can control the amounts of walks. In this case, one walk would equal one particle of disease, and the steps the, the walk can take, the walks can take in this case would be the amount of time the disease travels. When running these walks, I noticed something peculiar. When I changed the probabilities of, a, of certain directions, the average distance traveled and, and the direction changed. When the probabilities were equal, as you can see here, the disease traveled the least amount of distance and tended to stay in the middle. For, this, for these two pictures, I have the number of steps at 50, so that's the amount of, the, it would be 50 units of time traveled, and the number of walks to 100, so it would be 100 um, particles. In terms of the, these, oh wait, in that amount of time, the average distance traveled in that amount of time allotted was about six units. The increasing the steps per walk, which is the amount of time, greatly influences the distance traveled. The probabilities of moving were equal, having each distance set to 25, a 25% chance. On this next slide, I changed the directional probabilities for north and east to 45% each, and south and west were only a mere 0.05%. As you can see, there were some drastic changes, even though I did not change the number of walks or the steps per walk. It moved much more northeast, and the average distance tra traveled nearly quintupled becoming 28 units. Therefore, I concluded that the time, while the time is a factor, the, de the directional probabilities are the main component. This shows that the, the only thing that would be left to do is use the diffusion constant to calculate the actual probabilities for the disease, as well as plot plotting it over the map of the Virgin Islands. I would like to personally thank the university to, for giving me a chance to complete this research. My mentor, Dr. Stowes, for putting up with my many calls for assistance, and my research mates for doing this with me, and the people that gave this life financially. I would, I would like to continue this research and help the corals. Wonderful, great job, thank you. All right, if anybody has any questions, you can pop them in the chat. Um, I'll start with one question that I thought of while I was watching your presentation. So um, you talked about uh, diffusion and you used this diffusion model maybe as a way to like predict or um, study the way the disease is moving around. But are there other ways that the disease can spread besides diffusion in water? And would those be incorporated into your model in any way? Um, the disease also will spread, should spread um, via ocean currents and the wind. And once I keep going, that should be incorporated into my models as well. Okay, great. Thank you. 
so we have about five minutes before our next presentation. So if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to share them. So I have another question for you, I guess. Um, do you think that there are any seasonal differences that happen with the spread of this disease? And how could you incorporate those into your walk model? Um, I, I truly do not consider the seasonal differences, but now that I think about it, um, ocean currents, the ocean, well, we'd be incorporating ocean currents. And so with this incorporation, we would have day-to-day it's um, tracking of that. So when things change, we change too. So I, d I don't know if that answers your question, but when, when things change, we should, we change the, the models as well. So the ocean currents change, we change the, the ocean currents, if you see what, if you see Okay, what yes, uh, that does make sense. I guess maybe what I was trying to ask that I didn't articulate very well is about more so changes in temperature across seasons and whether or not those have an effect on? I personally don't think that um, it would have an effect on the travel. Okay, thank you. I'm I'll just add one thing. This is uh, Dr. Solsi. The, the currents will, once, the currents will determine those probabilities. So if you have the currents at every location, you'd have different probabilities. And so the walk would change based on those, on the, mainly the currents and, and the, and then the diffusion will also be impacted in the model. So that's, that's where the final goal is, to put together both of those. Okay, great. Thanks for clearing that up. Okay, we've got another question that came into the chat here. Um, so they start by saying, these questions may be more for um, you, Robert, um, but how much work is being done to slow the spread? Is there a team working on curing the disease and how long will it take to manage? Is it even possible to manage it? I'll let the, the there was a paper that the students read about um, using antibiotics and such. So I don't know if they wanna try. Um, yes, um, Dr. Marilyn Brandt, she is trying to um, give treatments to these infected corals, um, such as um, putting something in between the infected coral, the part of the infected, um, the infected part of the coral and the um, healthy part of the coral so it wouldn't go over and um, spread to the healthy part of that, that one infected coral. She said it's working, but um, I, I haven't been reading up on it. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Alrighty, so I think we will work then to queue up our next presentation, which is going to begin at 2.20 p.m. Um, we're going to be hearing from uh, Tia Rabsat, and she has a video recording presentation, so I will share that with you guys. And as a reminder, if anybody has been hopping in and out of our sessions, thank you for joining us. This is the marine biology session of the 18th annual Summer Student Research Symposium at UVI. And I ask that um, during our next presentation, if you guys have any questions for our speaker, that you put those into the chat so we can facilitate those quickly afterwards. Thank you. Okay, so today my talk will be on a recent coral disease that has been wreaking havoc on our reefs here in the Caribbean, and it's called the stony coral tissue loss disease. 
Specifically, we'll be focusing on a study whose objective was to compare the effectiveness of an untreated control to placebo pace and topical antibiotics against this disease. I chose this paper because using antibiotics as a method of disease prevention is a fairly new concept. So this paper provides a lot of relevant and necessary information for coral ecologists and conservationists at this time. So the stony coral tissue loss disease is a recently discovered lethal coral disease. It was first discovered in Florida in 2014, and since then it has quickly spread throughout the Caribbean, already affecting 22 out of 60 reef building coral species. The cause is currently unknown, but research speculates that it's associated with bacteria. This is also highly highlighted in this study due to the response to antibiotics. Its main characteristics include high transmission, as well as high prevalence and high rapid mortality, in some cases resulting in local extinction of certain species. They're specifically characterized for having multiple lesions, and this is shown in the figure below, which was taken by an MMES student. So this is a time series showing how quickly the disease can spread in a colony and kill it. So on the far left here on February 1st, you have these two white spots, and these two white spots are called lesions. The lesions are the diseased and infected areas. And within a couple of weeks, by February 21st, these lesions continue to spread, overtaking more than half of the colony. And then within a month, the entire colony has completely died. This is by March 17th. Completely died with no signs of recovery. And this stresses why exploring methods of intervention is direly important. All right. So this brings us back to our paper, which explores one of those methods of disease prevention by using topical antibiotics in the field. So this study was connect conducted in Florida, and the authors only selected corals that were affected with the stony coral disease. They had a total of 61 colonies that represented over five different coral species. And each colony had at least one to 12 active lesions, meaning that the disease was still spreading within that colony. And each of the colonies were randomly assigned to one of five treatments. Um, those five treatments being the control, which had no treatment. The second treatment was new base placebo, which is a hydrophobic ointment without the addition of antibiotics. They have treatment three, which was the new base plus amoxicillin, which is the same ointment, but with the addition of antibiotics, which is the amoxicillin. You have treatment four, which is called base 2B placebo, which is a paste that was designed to mimic coral mucus consistency without antibiotics. And then lastly, treatment five, which is new base plus amoxicillin, which is the same paste, but with the addition of the antibiotics. So um, they chose to add the placebos in order to eliminate the factor of just applying anything to the treatment lines and it having an effect. Rather, by having placebos, if the antibiotics showed to be effective then and the placebos didn't, then they could know for sure that it was the antibiotics that is causing these lesions to halt. So they monitored and tre they treated colonies and then they collected their results where they tallied the number of effective and ineffective treatments. Effectiveness was defined as the termination and cessation of disease progression at the treatment line. They performed the Fisher's exact test to analyze the proportion of halted lesions and they used this test because it's suitable for unequal and small sample sizes. They then used a T-test and a man whitney ransom test to make comparisons between the treatments. The T-test was used when equal variance assumptions were met, and the man whitney test was used when those assumptions were not met. As a result, they found that the percentage of halted lesions were higher in the treatment groups that were treated with the antibiotic amoxicillin than the placebos and the control group. And this is illustrated in this figure here, where on the x-axis, we have the five treatments, the control, the new base placebo, the new base with the antibiotics, 
base to be placebo and base to be with antibiotics. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of halted lesions per colony. And in the lesions here, legends, we have the different shapes and colors that represent the coral species and the error bars indicate standard error. So as you can see, the control, the new base placebo, as well as the base to be placebo were seen to be not effective because first of all, the control and the new base halted 0% of the lesions and base to be had lower percentages as well. While as for the two treatments with the antibiotics, the new base plus amoxy and base to be with amoxy, they have a higher success rate across all the tested species. Since they have a higher, since they, and this is shown since they have higher percentages, sorry, since they have higher percentages of halted lesions. So this shows us that using topical amoxicillin paste is a potential option for stony coral tissue loss disease intervention. The application of antibiotics was successful at halting the disease progression on all the species. Mm -hmm. However, I would like to note that the antibiotic effectiveness will only remain localized to the reason of application and it will not spread throughout the colony. Meaning that if the disease spreads within the colony outside of where the paste was applied, it wouldn't be effective and this was evident when new lesions appeared on some of the treated coral colonies. But despite that, this method is still beneficial to those who are actively trying to stop the spread of this disease. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tia. So if anybody has any questions for Tia, you can ask those now. We have about three minutes before our next presentation. We don't see any questions in the chat yet, um, but I have one question for you. I'm wondering about what the costs of this type of treatment are, especially given the widespread of the disease right now across corals in the territory. And I'm noticing now that maybe um, Tia is not on the call right now. She had a pre-recorded video. Um, so I guess we can um, reach out to her with any questions um, later on, unless she hops on here. So we'll wait about two minutes then until our next presentation is going to start. We're gonna be hearing from Bill Bacon. Great, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, as a reminder, we are in the marine bio session of the uh, Student Summer Research Symposium for UVI. Um, our next speaker is going to be um, Bill Bacon. And if you guys have any questions for him that you think of during the presentation, please drop those in the chat so we can facilitate them afterwards. Oh, restoration works. By now, 
Many people understand that pearl restoration is a viable method of growing endangered animals, restoring damaged pearl reefs, and establishing new artificial reefs. Some of the well-known benefits include improving tourist revenue and increasing the fish populations. If you wanted to start restoring pearls on your own, you would begin by searching the internet to find out what different methods are available and how well they have worked. You might start with searching YouTube or Google Scholar to find out all about the existing knowledge and try to compare how well the different approaches work. You would find thousands of results. Fortunately, Dr. Lisa Bronson and Erson has already led a team of researchers that did this search in 2020. They qualified over 360 different reports and organized them into a searchable Excel file. The objective of the study was to provide a systematic review of the current restoration efforts. They wanted to identify problems as well as successes, the types of coral used, locations, and future efforts. They identified and cataloged over 360 coral restoration project articles from practitioner surveys, scientific journals, brain literature, blogs, and videos. A database was created that included over 40 categories like information sources, location, species, methods, success rates, contact literature, and I think most important, different conclusions. The largest source was scientific literature, making up well over half the studies. The, stu the different studies included restoration efforts spanning 40 years, and the project reports varied in duration. Over half the studies were less than 18 months, although several were over 10 years. The restoration areas ranged from small laboratory projects to areas as, that were larger than one hectare. Most of the project areas were less than 500 meters. The survival rates varied from zero to 100%. The average survival rate reported was 66%, although this measure could be artificially high, as many studies that have high rates of failure are never published. The restoration efforts were categorized by method including coral gardening at about half, direct transplant made up about a fifth, microfragmentation, and larval enhancement followed. Larval enhancement is a newer method that seems to have the best potential for large scale restoration. In closing, the database that was produced by these researchers is a searchable Excel file that summarize the hundreds of articles and will provide a useful tool for anyone who would like to present a restoration project. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them after this video. Thank you very much. Good day. Great, thanks, Bill. So we have um, about six minutes for questions. If anybody has any for Bill, um, you can drop them in the chat or feel free to ask them now. Well, since nobody else seems to have a question, I'm, I'm interested in coral restoration. Uh, I'm also very interested in the effects of global warming and how coral restoration might be able to help us out and keep some species alive. But I'm concerned about 
the snail upon which this has been done. Um, when we're facing the warming sea temperatures and the, the acidification, um, I'm starting to feel that the best we can do is have a coral zoo where we can show our, perhaps show our children that, oh, the whole ocean used to be like this, or there used to be rich, a big rift full of corals, and here are just a few of them. And I'm really curious about how this might be able to be scaled up to uh, a, point, a point where the restoration will form a population of corals that is actually self-sustaining. And I would expect that to be through a sexual reproduction, uh, as well as maybe some more genetic blending to develop better corals that will resist the, the effects of the climate change. And I, I appreciate any thoughts on that, if anybody would like to join in. Thanks, Bill. So I guess I, um, maybe first I am wondering, do you have an idea of what the restoration just like here in the territory looks like right now? Uh, I know Dr. Brett has been working on a few coral nurseries in the, the deeper waters. Uh, they started up a new one just recently out on the east end of St. Thomas. And I would say within the last month or two, um, installed some coral trees. Coral World is also doing some work. But my, my particular interest is coral restoration in shallow water as I feel that that will help the tourism uh, more than corals out in the deeper water that are somewhat not accessible unless you have a boat. So my hope is that we can grow more coral in the shallow water, which I believe is a, a tougher environment in particular because of the temperature and, and the pollution that runs off of the, uh, the watershed into the bays and along the coastline. But I'm I'm not I'm not proving the information about how the other programs are working. Great. Yeah, I think those are good ideas. It, it sounds like you've done a lot of thinking about this kind of near shore type of system and there do seem to be some challenges associated with that. Um, I will say, I guess, when I was hearing you, you mentioned earlier um, this idea of like a coral type of museum. I know there's some work that is going on in the Florida Keys um, along like the front lines of the Skittle outbreak there. And um, they were visiting and removing corals from reefs where the outbreak was um, impending. So I guess in an attempt to save some of them. And I think some of those are going into something somewhat like a museum, but I don't know if it's open to the public or not. I know some of that work is done through the um, Florida Fish and Wildlife, so that might be one place for you to start and look. Well, I've also heard that some of that is going on with Coral World, that some of the susceptible corals have been picked and turned over to Coral World, where they can live in a, a safer environment. And I hope that they can keep those species alive. Yeah. But, I, I didn't know that they were um, doing that with those uh, here on island. So that's pretty cool to hear. Thanks for sharing. Okay, well, if anybody has any other questions for Bill, uh, please feel free to ask those. Now we've got one more minute before we're gonna queue up our last speaker of the day. Um, and Nicholas, I see you are on here. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation for you that has some pre-recorded video. Is that what you want me to share for your presentation? Uh, yes, please. Okay, great. I can do that on my end. Thanks. Okay, well everybody, um, if you're just hopping back on, we're in the marine biology session of our 18th annual Summer Student Research Symposium for UVI. And um, I'm happy to announce our last speaker of the day. We have uh, Nicholas Durgadine. 
Um, so I'll get his presentation going here. If you guys have any questions for Nicholas um, as his presentation goes, please feel free to put those into the chat or we can ask them at the end. Um, after this session, we will have a 10 minute period of time for any closing questions or comments or discussion. So please feel free to hang around for that if you're interested. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. My name is Nicholas C. Durgating and today I'll be presenting on my summer research that I did at the Nature Conservancy. The title of my presentation is The Effects of Sahara Dust on the Growth of Juvenile and Adult Corals. All right, so allow me to preface this and sort of give you an idea of what sort of inspired this project. So this year, the U.S. Virgin Islands, during the month of June, faced its largest Sahara dust plume it's faced in decades, at least that's according to the Washington Post. That being said, that kind of brought about the question of what sort of effect does Sahara dust have on the health of our coral ecosystems? Me being a marine biology major kind of made me wonder about that. So what I do know is that 182 million tons of dust spreads across the Atlantic Ocean and travels all the way into the Caribbean Sea. And this is coming all the way from the Sahara Desert within North of Africa. In that dust, I believe there's probably a bunch of minerals and trace metals that are probably within that and I sort of thought may harm the health of our corals. Now, we also know that Sahara dust is also linked to algae, algae blooms. For example, in Florida, on the coast of Florida, there is something known as the red, time, red tide. So we know about the algae is that the, red, the algae is sort of like competitors with the coral reefs. They kind of compete for space on substrates. And we know that the red tide algae, I mean the red tide bloom, is usually caused from bacteria trying to, well not bacteria, but it's actually the dinoflagellates but the dinoflagellates gets their sort of food source from the bacteria that like sort of fixate the nitrogen in the water and then makes it into something more consumable for the algae. I believe that that increase in algae may sort of like allow the algae to compete with the corals and sort of outcompete the corals and thereby end up taking away most of the area that the corals would have gotten for themselves. So, I hypothesize that adult corals incubated in the water treated with Sahara dust will calcify slower than the corals in the water without the Sahara dust, and that the juvenile coral polyps will only bud in the water without the Sahara dust. To determine their calcification growth, what I did is I used a buoyant weight and I weighed the corals. And by determining their weight, I can then tell like, okay, they've calcified this much because of their weight has increased. As for the budding process, what I did was I just looked at them under a microscope. Okay, so for the experimental design part... Alright, now let me get into the meat of my project, the results. So, alright, now let me get into... Hi guys, sorry, somebody just told me that we're having a problem with the slide advancement. I'm trying to share my um, screen. We were supposed to have a facilitator at the same time, so I apologize. Um, I can't see the chat and share the, the screen at the same time. Um, so we'll give this a go one more time. And I'm sorry, Nicholas, for the technical difficulties. If you would like, you could also try and share it from my point of view. Yeah, I think that actually might be a, a little bit easier, if you don't mind. Um, here, I will give you the ability to do that. Okay, let me get it up. Okay, great, thank you. No problem. Okay, are you able to see what I'm seeing? All right. Okay. So for the experimental design part of my project, I started off with a project plan and I made sort of an outline of what I'm gonna be doing. So, so I collected the dust of the Sahara dust from exposed surfaces 
So what I did was I really just collected the dust from any sort of exposed surface that was around the vicinity of, yeah, around the vicinity of TNC and where I thought they might just solely get Sahara dust. Then I also used a website known as earthschool.net where I was able to get sort of meteorology-like data. And so they gave me data like the amount of particulates, which was the Sahara dust that was gonna be in the air at the, within a unit area. And I then did some conversions with my mentor and we was able to figure out how much dust I should dose the corals with because I was gonna be keeping them in two miniature sized tanks. So we figured out how much dust to dose the corals with within those tanks. The approximate number we got was 0.2 grams. Then we used two species of corals and they were the microfragments. You can see those on the left-hand picture. So the two species of corals were the Orbicella and Orbicella fabulata and Orbicella and the Diploria labyrinthiformis, also known as OAN, OFAV, and DLAB. The Orbicella fabulata was actually the adult corals you see in the left hand, in the right hand picture, and the Diploria labyrinthiformis are the coral polyps that you'll see, that you saw in the first initial slide. And the next part of my project was trying to determine the polyps immediate response to the Sahara dust. So basically what I did there was I just sprayed the surface of the water with the dust. And then I tried to see what was their immediate reaction. So whether they retracted those tentacles and how long they may have done that for, and how long did it take them to let the tentacles back out after being exposed to the Sahara dust. I did it sort of compared, I compared the Sahara, their reactions with Sahara dust versus just being regular air or water. All right, now let me get into the meat of my project, the results. So the corals dosed with the Sahara dust weighed more than the corals that were not exposed to the Sahara dust. However, I should let you know that the corals that were in the Sahara dust, well, the corals that were gonna be in a container with the Sahara dust also did initially weigh more than the corals that were in the Sahara, that were not in the Sahara dust. However, the difference in weight wasn't nearly as significant as it ended up being by the end of week four. So none of the coral polyps in the tanks with the Sahara dust ended up budding. So in the tank with the Sahara dust, we had seven coral polyps. Those were the Diploria labyrinthiformis. Of the seven, oh, zero out of seven of them ended up budding. Whereas in the tank without the Sahara dust, the same D-lab species, two of the five of the coral polyps in there ended up budding. The budding process is simply when the corals end up dividing and that's really how they're gonna grow in their colonies. The next, next is the final difference in weight. So the difference in weight is simply just the difference in weight between the first week and the last week between the two containers. So 0.146 grams is the difference in weight in the last week. Whereas the initial weight difference was only 0.056 grams and that was the first week. The coral polyps exposed to the Sahara dust took on average 0.120, 120.1 120 more seconds to extend their tentacles after being exposed to the Sahara dust. So that's actually the project that I told you about, where I'm simply just spraying the Sahara dust over the water, and I'm trying to see how long they would take to re well, to extend their tentacles back out after they retract them. And 120.1 seconds is actually two times, well, that actually means that they took two times longer than they did to let their tentacles back out when they were exposed to the Sahara dust. Right below that, you can see a little chart where it says pure salt water and then Sahara dust salt water, and then a difference in weight. So what the difference in weight is, is simply just the sum of the first week for the corals that were in the Sahara dust, or that were in the pure salt water, and the sum of the corals that were in the pure salt water at the end of the last week, which is a four week process. So the difference in weight between the first, the fourth week and the first week is only 0.17. Whereas in the Sahara dust salt water, the difference in weight between the fourth week and the last and the first week is 1.07. In order to determine how, uh, an idea of how much they grew per week, all I simply did was just divide the growth by the number of weeks, which gave me the week increase. So in the pure salt water, they only increased by 0 0.04 grams, or approximately 0 0.04 grams. Whereas the Sahara dust salt water, the corals increased by 0 0.26, 
4.27 grams per week. Okay, so for discussion, I'm going to be breaking it up into four different parts. So first part is the minor stressors. So like I said, it's minor stressors, so none of this really is of significance, but I still think it's worth mentioning. Firstly is the WAPA. WAPA kept going in and out for the duration of my project. So WAPA going in and out kind of causing temperature fluctuations. So like we had a lighting system over the corals to keep the corals at a certain temperature, which is 29 degrees or approximately. Well, 29 degrees Celsius, give or take one. Yeah. And when WAPA will go out, sometimes that can cause the temperature to actually decrease because the light isn't keeping the, the water warm enough. Also, prior to the experiment, the corals were actually housed in tanks that were filled with artificial salt water. Artificial meaning that the water, salt water was man-made, so it wasn't taken from the ocean. I believe because it wasn't taken from the ocean, it might have been missing sort of trace minerals, and, well, trace metals, and minerals that could that would usually be found in the ocean and would actually help promote the growth of corals, like magnesium, calcium, things like that. Also, a lack of equipment. So one of the equipment that I was hoping to use is actually called a PCM, I mean a PCE RCM10, which is used to sort of identify all the particulates within dust or air. And you, I was hoping to use that to sort of get an idea of the composition of the dust. So I could figure out what exact, what exact minerals within the dust help promote the growth of corals. So like I figured because the dust is traveling all the way from within the Sahara Desert in Africa, traveling all across hundreds of miles and finally settling into the Caribbean Sea, I'm sure it's probably gathered some sort of minerals and dust to help the growth process. And then there was also a lot of gray area in particular, the budding process. So like for the budding process, I wasn't exactly sure when the corals were gonna bud. And I ended up having to refer to a few articles that weren't specifically talking about the coral species I was looking at, but similar coral species. And for that, I was, it would give me an estimate of like two to three months, which ended up aligning up sort of with the corals that I had. And the corals that I had did end up budding around that time. All right, so to conclude, the minerals within the Sahara dust does influence the calcification growth rate of the corals. However, that's under specific conditions. So I'm not too sure whether the, Sahara, the minerals within the Sahara dust is actually significant or well, not can actually influence the coral reefs on a larger scale. So like the region of the Virgin Islands, I'm not sure if it can actually influence it because of that grand area. But because it was in two little two miniature containers and because the water was actually missing sort of minerals and elements that would have helped its growth. That's why I found that it helped influence the growth rate in a positive way. It also appears to, to affect the budding process. Yeah, and the effect that Sarah dust does have on our coral reefs are likely to be negligible. So that goes back into what I was saying, like, if I was able to do this on a larger scale, I may possibly see that the results ended up being really insignificant on a grander scale. Okay, so here are my two references. Here are my acknowledge acknowledgements. Special thanks to the Caesar Tomorrow Island Alliance Program, the National Science Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, University of the Virgin Islands, all for making this project possible especially during these stressful times. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Great job, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now or drop them in the comments. And I can kick us off with a, a question for you. I'm curious, so my question maybe is more related to um, some of the methodology. So I noticed that you mentioned that you collected the dust just by scraping it off of surfaces. Could you speak a little bit more about that? And how do you know you weren't getting just like normal ambient dust? Okay, so like I said, I did actually scrape the dust. What I just used was a simple card or something that allowed me to get most of the dust off of a surface. And I just then collected it into falcon tubes. I ended up collecting like 17.73 grams of dust. 
as to whether it was pure Sahara dust or dust from the general area. I, there is no definitive way, because like I said, I was hoping to have some sort of device, like a P, like the PCE device that allowed me to determine how much of the, the composition of the dust. But I didn't get that, so I wasn't able to determine how much of it is Sahara dust. But I did also look at the dust, the amount of dust that the areas would be getting in general, and it never came to the extent as it did. Yeah, it never piled up to the extent that it did during the Sahara dust bloom, which was like a whole three, four day process. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas, that was very interesting. I like the way you did that. Um, I was serious about when you were weighing the coral when you, um, and how you would attribute the wet then to either the, the calcification or if they just absorb the dust and by absorbing the dust if that made them happy. Okay, so I think I get what you're asking, Bill. So I use some, a device called a buoyant weight which allows me to weigh the corals within water, but it still allowed me to figure out how much the actual coral did weigh. That's how I was able to get the weight of the coral. As for how I know that they were growing and not just absorbing the dust, well, one thing is I used the control and I kind of compared them I compared the corals that were in the Sahara dust to the corals that were in the control, which did not have any Sahara dust. So if it was that it was, if the dust played a sort of, if the dust didn't have any effect on the growth of the corals, then I would have pro then the corals probably wouldn't have grown to the extent that they did. And they probably would have been, sim the results probably would have been a bit more similar to that of the corals that were in the control. Whether or not I can tell that they're absorbing it, the dust, well, I'm not able to specifically say that they're not absorbing it, but I did look at them under a microscope. So that goes into like the second part of my project where I sprayed the surface of the water with the Sahara dust and I didn't watch the reactions. And I did that while I was looking at them, while I was looking at them under a microscope. And what I was able to tell from that was most of the dust did not actually settle on or go into the mouths of the corals of the coral polyps. What ended up happening was that they would just go into the surrounding area of it. So like all right here where you can see the little bubble, they would go around it and they wouldn't actually settle like on it. So I don't think they absorbed any of the dust. If anything, I believe the dust might have been breaking down within the water. Maybe, I don't know if there's some sort of acidity level in the water that caused the dust to break down into more consumable, I guess, minerals that allowed the corals to grow or well, the coral polyps to grow. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I thought it was very interesting. Thanks for doing this and presenting it. No problem, Bill. I have one more question for you, Nicholas. Um, how did you, and I apologize if you said this and I missed it, but how did you determine how much dust to use in your experimental setup? So I had used a website called earthschool.net. Yeah, earthschool.null. And that website gave me an idea of how much dust was gonna be in a unit area, which was a meter square, a meter cubed. And through that process, my mentor and I worked together and we ended up finding out how much well, we was going to be storing the corals in miniature tanks, like in the picture right. right here. And through that process, we ended up doing some conversions to figure out how much dust was going to be in that small area. Well, we should dose the corals within the small tank. Did I answer your question or should I explain it a bit further? No, I think that makes sense. I guess I'm just curious about the initial source that you used for that amount. Um, because Sahara dust can come in waves, right? And sometimes there will be pulses mm -hmm. where there's more dust or less dust. So I what did you use mm -hmm. for your baseline? Well, I had also gathered, I also figured out how much dust is gonna, the corals were gonna be exposed to on a pretty much daily basis. So 
prior to the experiment or prior to me starting dosing the corals with the dust, I also used earthschool.null website to figure out how much dust was going to be within the area of St. Croix every day. And by doing that, I was able to get an idea of how much average, the average amount of dust was going to be in. Ex the corals are going to be exposed to on a daily basis. Okay, great. That makes sense. And I see that um, Robin has shared the, the link to that website in the chat if anybody wants to check it out. All right, does anybody else have any questions for Nicholas before we conclude our session? All right, well, great. Thanks, Nick. You can um, stop sharing your screen. You did a great job. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but you handled it really smoothly. We appreciate that. So um, I just want to see, are there any other questions or things that anybody would like to bring up for any of the other speakers or presentations they didn't get to mention earlier? Okay, well, I want to take a second to thank all of our speakers from today. You guys all did a great job. It was really cool to hear about the work that you did over the summer, especially given all of the crazy difficulties that went on with doing research in the midst of this um, pandemic. So you guys did an awesome job and you should feel really proud for the work that you did. I'd also like to thank all of the mentors um, for your continued um, commitment and support to contribute to undergraduate student success. Um, and then I want to thank and acknowledge the funders for this research as many of our speakers did throughout the presentation. We thank the National Science Foundation, HBCU Up Grant, NIH RISE and the MARC grants, along with the College of Science and Math and the Emerging Caribbean Scientists Program, and also the generous donations of private donors. So with that, I think that concludes our session. Um, thank you again, everybody. You did a great job, um, and it was really great to hear about your research. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.